a more promising approach to um, uh, priority setting comes from cost effectiveness analysis because it at least promises the uh, uh, uniform metric for comparing different diseases. Uh, so the health adjusted life year that's saved or uh, produced by an intervention is the unit and this allows you to compare conditions that uh, involve both mortality and morbidity. Um, however, uh, cost effectiveness uh, as it's um, developed, been developed, does not include uh, a lot of sensitivity to distributive consequences. And this is a source of a lot of ethical critique of cost effectiveness. Uh, it tells you how to get the biggest health effect per dollar spent, but it doesn't tell you who gets that health effect. And one of the um, goals of cost effectiveness, or one of the uh, points that's made about it, is that the measure of effectiveness, let's say a quality, a quality adjusted life year, um, is viewed as the same unit regardless who gets it or where it occurs in a life. And this is uh, a part of the mantra or uh, uh, declaration of cost effectiveness proponents that it's got a common unit of measurement. However, uh, many of us think that it matters who gets health care. Uh, if people are worse off with regard to health, we might think improving their health is more important than improving somebody whose health is more significantly uh, more advanced. Um, so if we think that, we are concerned about where we put a unit of effectiveness within a life or across lives. Let's take the middle row that talks about giving some priority to the worst off. What I said about cost effectiveness is that it takes a stand that says uh, a quality is a quality is a quality wherever it appears. And this is uh, a way of saying that we should give no priority to people who are worse off. And yet our intuitions about fairness suggest we ought to give some priority to people who are worse off. Um, and, but do we give absolute priority to people who are worse off? Um, I think most of us would say we shouldn't do that and it leads to an implausible result because suppose we can't produce much health in somebody who's very, very ill, should we still treat them as having the greatest priority? Many of us would say, well, if we can't do much, maybe we should think about other uses of the health resources. And so people have different views about fairness. Some would say always favor the worst off. Some would say never favor them. Uh, and some would take a middle position. I think most people take a middle position. But that is not a position that's describable in principle. Um, so I, I think we have a, a, a illustrate, I have illustrated here a very general problem with cost effectiveness that it is insensitive to the distribution of the benefits that it talks about. And many of us think fairness is focused very intensely on concerns about who gets what. What happens when we have the kinds of disagreements I've illustrated? Um, it's in that context that I think we have to rely on, not on principle, um, but on a process for making decisions. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest is that uh, the core of uh, health policy will focus on a decision-making process. Um, uh, so the claim I want to make is that if we have no prior agreement on principles regarding what is fair and just in the allocation of resources, we have to accept the outcome of a fair process 
as fair and legitimate. And this is a general characterization of what in the philosophical literature is called pure procedural justice. So what I've suggested is that with regard to the priority to the worst off problem, um, we don't have agreement on a principle. Many of us think we ought to give some priority to those who are worse off, but not complete priority, and certainly not no priority. But we disagree with each other about how much priority, and that's going to show up in our differences in how we want to allocate resources. Um, If we then think practically about what processes we put in place, what we should notice about this assumption that I made, that the outcome of a fair process will count as fair and legitimate, is that uh, the kind of situation we're in is a little different from uh, what we might think of as pure procedural justice. Um, in the philosophical literature, and here I have in mind John Rawls' discussion of, uh, of uh, procedural justice, um, he contrasts impure with pure procedural justice. In impure procedural justice, we have a prior conception of what we count as just, what we have a prior agreement on a principle. Let's take criminal trials as an example. Most of us will agree right off the bat that um, uh, we should convict all and only the guilty in a criminal trial. And we try to set up criminal trials to do that. We give a reasonable, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt as a criterion for evidence in a, in, a, in a trial. And that may be whether we're talking about conviction by a judge or conviction by a jury. Um, we think that the evidence has to be overwhelming, that somebody is guilty, because we're very afraid of convicting innocent people. So we want to convict all and only the guilty. Uh, we do have room for noticing that evidence uh, would uh, work out in a way that is contrary to the actual con uh, trial that we run. So suppose we have a, uh, a trial and we judge it to be a fair trial. Good arguments were presented on both sides and the judge has made uh, a decision about who was guilty. But later along comes some evidence, let's say it's DNA evidence, that shows that the person who was convicted, perhaps by eyewitness testimony, turns out not to be guilty, wasn't even there. Uh, Biological samples don't prove that this person couldn't have been the culprit. Um, we might then think we ought to overturn the outcomes of a fair trial. The trial was fair, but it got, got it wrong. And that's what's meant by saying this is impure procedural justice. We have a criterion, convict all and only the guilty. And we try to use a trial to tell us uh, to, or to guide us towards who we think the best evidence would point to as being guilty, but we might get it wrong. Now, the contrast with pure procedural justice is that we may not have a criterion for what counts as a fair outcome. Take the example I gave a moment ago about giving priority to the worst off. Some of us think we should give a lot of priority. Some of us think we should give some priority. Uh, maybe only a few people think we should give complete priority and a few people think we should give none. Most people are in the middle. Uh, but they disagree with each other about how much priority and they might um, disagree about resource allocation questions in part because they're disagreeing about that. Um, that's the kind of decision that I think we have in health policy all the time. Cases where there's a lot of disagreement um, <clears throat> and we have to find a process for resolving it. But we can't say we've got, we know what counts as fair. What counts as fair has got to emerge from the process.
Finally, the last point I want to make is that uh, I've given presentations like this to, um, oh, uh, one example that comes to mind is the ministers of uh, health in China at the state level. And one of them very wisely asked me, does it work? And um, this got me thinking, well, what's the evidence that the approach I'm talking about works? And the answer is we don't have a lot of good evidence. It's in theory justifiable, but to give good evidence, you'd have to have evidence of a lot of decision making that actually complied with these conditions and was judged to be both, to yield decisions that were more legitimate and more fair. And we might have some direct way of measuring what counts as legitimacy, although it's not easy. Uh, well, what do people accept? Uh, and there may be some survey results that could throw light on that. But fairness is even more problematic because I started by saying, um, we don't have a criterion for what counts as fair, and we have to accept the outcome of a fair process as what's fair. But the point I'm making now is that how do we measure whether we get fairer decisions if we didn't have a prior agreement on what counts as fair? Since we don't have that agreement, we need a process. Uh, but the outcome of that process might not comply with some people's judgments about fairness. And if so, what do we do about that? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs>